Americans eat better than any other people on earth. We're generous too. We like to share what we have. Unfortunately, a lot of what we share, we share with insects. It's estimated that this country loses $20 billion worth of food a year, destroyed by pests. In one recent 12-month period, all the retail food stores in the United States made a profit of $1.3 billion. They lost $1.6 billion in pilferage, and they lost another $4.4 billion to pests. In the armed forces, the problem is much more severe. Unlike commercial stores, the military must stockpile, holding vast quantities on hand to provide for an emergency. In addition, stored products must be shipped all over the world. One more link in the chain. One more great opportunity for the insects to work their enormous damage. Due to insect infestation, it has been necessary from time to time to fumigate nearly half the insect-prone items in key military depots. When that happens, the cost is huge to the armed forces, to the government, to us as taxpayers. The cost in dollars for goods destroyed. The cost in health problems from the illnesses spread by pests. It is a cost we cannot tolerate. And so a massive pest control program has been organized in the Defense Supply Agency and throughout the armed forces. It's beginning to work, but to be effective it must be supported and active at every level. The whole program breaks down if there's one weak link in the chain. That's where you come in. Your support, your effort are necessary. No matter where you are. Large warehouse, small storeroom, on land or sea. This film will show you what the program involves and how it works. It used to be that you could assign just about any available warm body to the job of pest control operator. But not anymore. These days, an operator must be trained and certified. And because the field is changing so quickly, he must be retrained and recertified every two years. At any depot or installation, any place that goods are stored in quantity, an effective pest control program depends on teamwork. There are two or three representatives who need to inspect the goods in a warehouse. A veterinarian food inspector, a pest control operator, and perhaps a quality assurance specialist. For an effective pest control program, it's vital that these men cooperate and work closely together. A thorough joint inspection should be done once a month, more often in hot and humid weather. Much of the non-perishable or dry stores food commodities in military warehouses is susceptible to pest infestation or contamination. Food in cans or jars is almost the only exception. Textiles, such as clothing, blankets and so forth, are also a prime target for insects. 
wood products attract beetles, termites, and other boring insects, so must be regularly checked. After a thorough inspection of the product packaging and the building, the team should gather samples of the most vulnerable items and examine them carefully. In order for the men to do a proper job of inspecting, it's important that the warehouse be laid out with an aisle every few feet. If the stacks are jammed together, good inspection is nearly impossible. Aisle spacing is also important for proper housekeeping. Sanitation and housekeeping are among the most vital requirements for pest control. Whether in a major depot, or in the smaller warehouse of a camp, base, or other installation. Cleanliness is essential. Food must never be consumed in a warehouse. A storage building that isn't kept clean is practically guaranteed to bring an appreciative horde of insects and rodents. There must be plenty of trash cans around the building. A rodent-proof type with cover. And you've got to make sure people use the cans. This kind of trash can't be tolerated. All material and equipment has to be kept clean of any substance that will attract pests or provide food for them. Personnel should be constantly reminded about the need for cleanliness until it becomes an instinct. They should know without having to be told that spilled items must be cleaned up right away. Pest control only works if the proper measures are taken every step of the way. For certain types of food items, the process has to begin right at the contractor's plant. Because this flower is headed for a DSA warehouse, where it'll be stored for some time, the contractor has to put it into special bags, called insect resistant treatment, or IRT bags. The bags are made out of a sandwich of layers. The outer layer has been treated with an insecticide. A barrier layer prevents the insecticide from migrating into the food in the bag. The insecticide is effective for one year from the date the bag was fabricated. Transportation of highly susceptible goods presents a real problem. It's been estimated that some 95% of freight cars have insects. During the cold winter months, when insects are dormant, this doesn't pose a difficulty. But from May to October, the contractor has to take special precautions on shipments to the military. Every rail car used for transporting certain designated types of food products during the warm months, has to be fumigated before it leaves the contractor's plant. The procedure is known as in-transit fumigation. At a depot or installation, when fumigated rail cars arrive, it's a job for the pest control shop. The cars must be opened by two men. And at least one of them must be a trained and certified pest control operator. Two men are required as a kind of buddy system, since the fumigation gases can be deadly. They first check to make sure the car has been under fumigation for at least 72 hours. They must not open the car until the specified time to ensure that the fumigation has been effective and as a safety precaution because of the intense gas levels during the first 72 hours. Even beyond the initial period, 
gas levels in the car may still be dangerous. Before entering the car, they leave it with the door standing open for at least an hour. The shipper may have used any of three forms of aluminum phosphide. Pellets or tablets in envelopes, powder filled bags, or prepackaged pellets. Each manufacturer provides information about the handling and disposal of aluminum phosphide. You are governed, however, by the procedures outlined in Military Standard 1486 or the Technical Information Memorandum No. 11 of the Armed Forces Pest Control Board. Clearing the car is a job that must be done wearing gas masks. The mask itself and the canister must be specifically approved for use with the aluminum phosphide fumigant. Gloves are also required. Ordinary work gloves should not be used, but disposable plastic or rubber gloves are fine. The job itself is straightforward. Remove the fumigant containers. Take a gas reading in several locations in the car to determine that the air is safe. Count the number of containers removed from the car. Check the count against the number shown on the sign to be sure they've all been located. Then destroy the residue fumigant. This is done by stirring the powder into a bucket of either liquid detergent or alcohol, depending on the type of fumigant package. The slurry that forms is completely harmless and safe. The slurry can be poured into an approved sewer or buried in an approved landfill. The gloves and the fumigant packagings are contaminated. They must be disposed of by burial. However, these contaminated materials must not be tossed into a GI can awaiting disposal. A pile of this material left together can actually explode, and it has happened. The same kind of in-transit fumigation that's used on certain shipments from contractors is also carried out on some shipments outbound from a depot. A rail car that's to be fumigated first has to be thoroughly cleaned. Every opening has to be sealed up with tape or caulking. That can be a big job. Some cars are in a poor state of repair. But the job has to be done very thoroughly, or the gas will leak out, the fumigation won't work, and the bugs will take over. When the car is prepared, it's loaded in the normal way before fumigating. One precaution, however, the men must use a little extra care in loading so they don't pull out any of the tape or patches. Now fully loaded, the car is ready to receive its dose of aluminum phosphide. The work is done in the open air outside the rail car. Again, safety requires two men wearing gloves and with gas masks readily available. A 
aluminum phosphide pellets are counted and placed in envelopes made of a special material that lets the gas pass through. The envelopes fastened to a sheet of cardboard are mounted to the wall inside the car. Then the door is closed and carefully sealed all around. Finally, the men put up warning signs on both doors in addition to other signs placed inside the car where they will be seen on entering. These signs must be completely filled in so the men who later open the car will have all the information they need to ensure their safety. As the final step, the door of the car is sealed with a yellow aluminum phosphide fumigation tag. Now let's talk about basic techniques for preventing insects. In addition to general housekeeping and sanitation, there are two principal methods. The first is residual spraying. This lays down a coating of insecticide that protects against crawling insects. Spraying must be repeated regularly, all year round, even in cold weather. How often depends on the chemical used. It's important to note that some residual sprays are safe to use in food storage areas. Others are not. The pesticide to be used, the strength of the pesticide, and the method of application will be prescribed by the command or staff entomologist. The second basic technique of prevention is for control of flying insects. The technique is referred to as space treatment. A small area like this is done with a small portable type of ULV or ultra low volume unit. To be effective, the treatment must be repeated quite often. However, it is not required in mild or cold weather. Again. The choice of chemical or specific equipment to be used will be prescribed by the command or staff entomologist. The preferred method for a large building calls for using a special type of dispenser that is designed to treat up to a million cubic feet of storage space. After the warehouse crew has left for the day, the dispenser is set in one corner of the building. It is loaded with a predetermined quantity of chemical. The controls are set for the fan and the insecticide pump. Timers are set so the chemical will be dispensed through the night, ending the next morning. Ventilators are turned off. All doors closed and locked. Warning signs are posted at all entrances and the building is left sealed for the night.
In the morning, no special procedure is required. Just open the doors for ventilation and turn on the fans. The machines have finished their work and shut off and the vapors have dissipated. It's bound to happen at times. The prevention fails. And you find you're going buggy. That's no longer the big problem it once was. If the infestation is confined to a small area, you can control the problem by fumigation. To prepare, two items of information are needed. One is the temperature of the stack which has a bearing on how long the fumigation will have to last. The other is the dimensions of the stack. How much chemical is required depends on the cubic footage to be fumigated. It's very strongly recommended that standard checklists be used for each fumigation job. A standard format for the checklist is given in this Armed Forces Pest Control Board TIM. Among other things, the checklist will help personnel remember that several departments have to be notified when a fumigation is being done. Fire, security, medical, and so on. The chemical used for fumigation is aluminum phosphide. It is, as they say, safe when used as directed. But it can cause severe illness, even death. The problem is that men who work with it all the time may grow careless, start taking shortcuts. It's essential to make sure that pest control workers remember the rules and observe them. For example, Aluminum phosphide must never be handled by one man alone. There must always be at least two men on the job. A kind of buddy system. The procedure involves covering the stack with polyethylene sheets. All sharp corners and edges are taped to eliminate tearing and billowing of the polyethylene. Sand snakes are placed along the floor to seal the whole thing. Then the men don gloves and make sure their gas masks are readily available. Again, the mask must be a type approved for use with aluminum phosphide. And the same for the canister. With these precautions, it's safe to open the aluminum phosphide container. Tablets or pellets must be spread so that they are not touching. This also makes it easier to get an accurate count of the pellets. If left in a pile instead of being spread, there is also the danger of explosion. The chemical acts by combining with water in the air. It takes about half an hour before the toxic phosphine gas starts being released. The job should not be allowed to take longer than half an hour. If a carbide odor is detected, 
then gas masks must be put on at once. The gas will kill all insects within the plastic tent. However, it has no residual effect. This means that it's only effective during the period of fumigation. On the other hand, it also means that the chemical is safe to use with food products. There's no danger for warehousemen as long as they stay clear of the immediate area. To make sure they do, a temporary barrier is put up five feet from the stack on all sides. What are the symptoms of this poison? Although accidents are very rare, first aid training should be a regular routine because any gas is dangerous. Pest control operators and all warehousemen must be able to recognize the symptoms of phosphine poisoning, such as tightness in the chest, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness and must know what actions to take if it should happen. Each 24 hours after beginning the fumigation, the pest control operators check on the progress. They sample the air near the stack to be sure no dangerous gas is leaking out. Then they take and record a reading of the gas level within the stack to make sure it's high enough for achieving a certain kill. It's very important that fumigation be continued for the full time required, 72 hours or longer, depending on temperature. Quitting too early may leave some insects still alive. They will multiply rapidly, leaving you right back where you started. Rats. Wild rats destroy millions of dollars worth of goods every year. What's more, they spread some of the worst diseases affecting man. When they come, they leave their calling cards behind. Droppings, tracks, damaged goods, and other telltale signs. But you shouldn't wait until you see the signs. Rodent control should be a continuous program. The most effective method is, again, plain, ordinary cleanliness. A place that has no food or water available for rats is unlikely to have any rats. But there are other steps you can take too when necessary. You can erect rat barriers. You can set traps. You can put out poison bait. This is the most effective way of handling a large-scale problem. However, these poisons are also dangerous to man and to dogs, cats, and other animals. They must be used with care by people properly trained in handling them. Well, one thing is sure, you always know when you've got them. Unfortunately, you can also be sure they won't be easy to get rid of. Often the best approach is simply to eliminate the roosting areas by placing wire screening over exposed beams inside or outside the building. Another way is to spread bird repellent or to set live traps. However, any chemical control 
or trapping of birds must be approved by your command entomologist. Pest control. We've come to recognize that it's an important job. Important because of the huge cost of not doing it. And because of the illness that pests can spread. It's a job with straightforward demands, whether in a big warehouse or a small storeroom. It is a job that requires the professionalism to keep up in a field that is constantly changing with new chemicals and new techniques. And it's a job that requires vigilance to continue what seems to be a never-ending battle against insects. <laughs>